Hi folks, and welcome to our week on sound. I hope you enjoyed the film Gravity. We'll get to that in the next lesson. For now, we're going to go through a few terms to help us understand the formal elements of film sound. The most important set of terms uh, for understanding film sound, and actually they're super useful terms for just talking about uh, the art of film in general. And I've said these terms before, but I'll say them again. Diegetic versus non-diegetic sound. Um, so what's the difference between them? Diegetic sound is any sound presented as originating from a source in the film's world. And non-diegetic sound is sound such as mood music or a narrator's commentary that's presented as coming from outside the film's world. A fiction film in the sound era generally has both going on at the same time. To kind of illustrate the difference, I'll look at a kind of uh, cinematic joke from the film Blazing Saddles, the likes of which you've seen throughout many different films and, and really television shows. Check it out. Okay, so this is a, uh, an old kind of joke, but you'll see that it illustrates the clear distinction between diegetic and non-diegetic music. In the beginning, we look at a character. We hear music, but we don't uh, assume that that music is coming from the world of the film. We understand it as part of the convention of music to support uh, the image either as a kind of emotional cue uh, or something to kind of keep us engaged. In any case, we know without having to think about it that this music is, doesn't have a source in the world of the film. And then what happens is it is revealed that the music does have a source. this does is it transforms the music from non-diegetic to diegetic. Um, I hope that's fairly clear. Um, and that's a very simple example. We're going to basically spend the entire lesson uh, getting closer and closer to more complicated examples, but the simple distinction is a good one to hold on to. Um, notice a similar kind of thing, but with a little more complexity and without the kind of jokey status in the opening of uh, Wes Anderson's film Moonrise Kingdom. So uh, the film here is playing with that conventional distinction between diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound, but it's adding another layer to it. Um, unlike the previous example in which the sound was literally the same, just the status of it had changed with the revelation of the on-screen band. Here, the sound quality changes from one that is clearly marked as having a source in the world, right? That like a tinny, low quality uh, little uh, record player, right? That we hear at the beginning. 
And then the sound that we associate with non-diegetic music, right, produced in a studio, full quality, high quality, is revealed at a certain moment on the beat and with a cut to the outside of this interior space. Right? And there's a certain logic to this, right? Because when we're inside the space of the house, we can literally hear the source of that music. But when we're outside, we can't hear it. And so it's a perfect moment in which to do this transition from the tinny source music, diegetic sound, to the swelling non-diegetic sound uh, of uh, the score. Okay, now I'm going to look at one that's a little more complicated. Uh, the film Marie Antoinette is a uh, is playing with usages of um, sound and music that are inconsistent with what we expect in a period piece, and it's doing something uh, also with diegetic and non-diegetic. Check out this sequence, which is one of my favorites. stop it there because it already illustrates the distinction that I want to make. I hope that you're seeing a, a tension between diegetic and non-diegetic that at first seems rather conventional, um, but if you pay attention both to the instruments being used, the sound quality, uh, and uh, the history, or the historical sensibility uh, evoked by the quality of the music, you'll see that um, Sofia Coppola is playing a very subtle trick on us, right? Uh, the scene begins with this set of sounds. So what can we say about those sounds? First thing, that they uh, use instruments that are associated with 18th century classical music, particularly that tinny harpsichord uh, kind of sound, right? Old uh, pre-piano pianos, right? So we can hear that immediately. The second thing is that if we know it, we can maybe hear a uh, instrumental version of the pop song that's going to be played by um, Susie and the Banshees. And um, if we don't, we at least hear music that is consistent with the kind of music that would maybe be playing in an 18th century ball. Um, so it works on maybe a couple levels, two levels if we know the song, and only one level if we don't. In any case, we hear music that is consistent with the period of the world that we're in. And then something shocking happens at the cut. So with the cut and the shot of the people actually dancing to this music, we get the real song, not this, um, not this cover, not this 18th century cover. The real song is from the 20th century. It couldn't have played in the world of the film. And interestingly, you'll see a different kind of sonic quality. Now the music sounds as if it is echoing in this space. It isn't just literally diegetic, it sounds diegetic, right? So we went from a seemingly non-diegetic sounding music, because it felt like full orchestra in a studio, but having diegetic qualities associated with the period of the film, 18th century, to the inverse, right? A song that we wouldn't think to be diegetic because, of course, it comes from the 20th century, but with a sonic quality that evokes the, die the diegetic qualities of music playing in the world of the film, that it echoes the space of the ballroom. It's a complete inversion of our expectations, right? It's like a, a sonic version of the uh, Converse sneaker that we see in the film, really playing with um, anachronism. Okay, uh, we've also seen a film that played with expectations of diegetic and non-diegetic, and it was uh, an example of what you might call a classical Hollywood film, not the kind of film that would break rules. But this film, Rear Window, breaks interesting rules, or at least it plays with certain rules um, that are consistent with our expectations in Hollywood film. 
um, and I'll just refresh you about what those are. And the question I would ask you, the question I would ask you about this film is, is there any non-diegetic sound in it at all? And when we first watch the film and we hear music, and the music is played as an accompaniment to the camera moving around the space. It feels as if it should be non-diegetic music, right? Because it's very common for a film to begin with something like this. Um, if we really pay attention to what our ears can hear, we might think, huh, this doesn't quite sound like a full quality studio produced piece of music. It sounds as if it's echoey, e echoey and tinny, right? Um, and we might be forming inferences. But then we hear this. And I want to say this at that moment, that the sound stops, a radio announcer uh, takes over, and then the sound itself is modified by a person in the world. And this is the moment that the film announces a conceit that we might not have understood in the first few minutes. The conceit being, of course, that all of the sound in this film, atmospheric sounds, musical sounds, radio voice sounds, um, are going to be diegetic, right? We're not gonna always see the fact that someone can modulate them with the turn of a radio dial, but the conceit is that uh, we are going to hear music that feels non-diegetic, but it's going to be, in some sense, literally diegetic, right? That is a trick of the film. And Shion says a music cue inscribed in the action can, of course, be just as commentative as a non-diegetic music cue. In other words, the film is still using uh, music in a non-diegetic way, right? It comments on the action, sometimes in an ironic way, sometimes in a supportive way, but it is literally inscribed in the world of the film. That's what makes the sound in Rear Window quite special and unusual. Okay, so some functions of non-diegetic music. We've talked about the kind of ways that we can use the diegetic, non-diegetic distinction in order to kind of read the poetic ambitions of a film's use of sound. Now let's talk about some basic functions of what you can do with non-diegetic music. Remember we talked about montage sequences uh, last week in our unit on editing. Um, what is music good for in a montage sequence? Well, non-diegetic music drowns out diegetic sound in order to draw our attention away from the discontinuity of the images. And I'll remind you that the famous Rocky montage sequence, which I keep using as an example, famously has music attached to it. Uh, fairly iconic, this is familiar to you. Have you ever asked yourself what would happen if we took a classic montage sequence with music overlaying action and reversed it, took out the music and added uh, diegetic sound effects? Well, here's what it would maybe look like with a bit of, with a bit of exaggeration. This is a particularly exaggerated example, but I think the idea it conveys is that non-diegetic sound kind of paves, paves over the discontinuity of the image in a montage sequence. 
Um, and when we uh, take that music out and replace it with sounds emanating from human figures, um, it doesn't quite work. Um, a similar principle here, I want you to pay attention to a film, an entire film that more or less takes the montage sequence as almost the aesthetic organizing principle of the entire thing. It would be strange to think of an entire film as one big montage sequence, but the later films of Terrence Malick, such as Tree of Life, have been described that way. And I think it's a useful way to think about how they are aesthetically organized. And I want us to pay attention just a bit to the way the image and sound work together in our experience of this, um, and just uh, point out some moments of sonic poetics. taught us there are two ways through life. The way of nature and the way of grace. You have to choose which one you'll follow. I want you to pay attention to just how, how wild and, and jumpy um, the image track is, but how it still seems fluid because of the, f the fluidity of the voiceover and the music. Accepts being slighted, forgotten, disliked. Accepts insults and injuries. You'll see here a lot of jump cuts. You'll actually have jumps in time. Get others to please it too. Sometimes you'll get diegetic sound, but but very quiet. Like you got from Brad Pitt in that moment. To have its own way. It finds reasons to be unhappy when all the world is shining around it. And love is smiling through all things. Notice that the film will allow itself to jump to something totally different. You could even call this a non-diegetic insert, um, but it feels poetically or organic with respect to the way the sequence is organized because partly of how sound is used. I will be true to you. Whatever comes. So a moment like this, which is uh, the moment we're actually kind of transitioning out of this montage po uh, poetic mode to the kind of um, more scene-based um, diegetic now mode, is that where the, the sound is starting to subside and diegetic sound is starting to increase. Notice that the level between the kind of choral soundtrack and the uh, snap and click of the door opening is starting to change a bit, right? You can actually hear that. Right, and this is one of the first moments in which um, a major plot event will happen. Um, so that was kind of to illustrate what you can do or what uh, non-diegetic music generally does uh, to montage sequences, allowing us to kind of um, play fast and loose with spatiotemporal presentness. Um, but now let's look at some other terms that I want you to know and which I'm likely to test you on. One of those terms is a sound bridge. Uh, what is the sound bridge? It happens like this. Before transitioning from one scene to another, the sound from the previous scene carries over briefly before the new scene begins. A great example of that um, comes from the, the scene in The Matrix. It's the question that brought you here. You know the question, just as I did. What is The Matrix? The answer is out there, Nina. It's looking for you, and it will find you if you want it to.
Okay, um, right at the end there, we got a sound bridge. Not just a sound bridge, um, but a kind of ambitious and thematically uh, motivated one, right? I think what they're trying to get at is that I think familiar feeling of waking up from a dream um, and having the sound that's say happening in your room at the present moment uh, integrate itself into your dream and experiencing that flux from hearing the sound in the dream to hearing the sound in the real world. And we're getting that exactly um, as uh, the kind of rhythmic beat from the alarm um, integrates itself rather fluidically or, or rather um, smoothly with the sound from the club, the music. Um, and of course, it's the sound bridge that functions to pave over the abruptness from one space to another, but it also thematically makes us think about um, this experience of the lack of distinction between waking and dreaming states. Okay, um, that does it for this lesson. Next lesson, we're going to kind of nuance the distinction between diegetic and non-diegetic and see uh, examples that blur the lines between these two categories even further.